Be'ezat Hashem, Naseh V'Natzliach. I want to welcome you to another session of our Parashat HaShavua learning. This week is Parashat Be'ar. Uh, before we get started with tonight's class, which is how to balance your work life and your spiritual life through this learning in Parashat Behar, I'd like to give some honorable mentions and dedications to the following people. Be'ezat Hashem, that tonight's class will be dedicated in honor of we Baruch Shemosh Hakadosh Baruch Hu, in honor of Jacqueline Bat Alia and Tova Shindel Bat Alta. Also, that tonight's class will be to the Ilu Nishmat of David Ben Zohara and Yves Ben Rina, Mishel Ben Zohara, Aviv Ben Vivi, Esther Bat Alia, Abraham Yoshua Ben Sultana, Simon Ben Alia, Mazal Bat Luna, Meir Ben Rebecca, Sultana Bat Frecha, Yitzchak Ben Sevilla, Nisim Ben Meir, Rachel Bat Bela, Yaakov Ben Tamar, Susan Bat Shaba. Yehuda ben Aharon, Brendel bat Meirdov, Shalom ben Zohara, Chana bat Chava, and Kranchi bat Brendel. Also, the tonight's class will be to the health and healing, Refua Shelema of Amram ben Zohara, Lavi Rafael ben Olga, Daniel bat Mazal, Yaakov ben Dina, Keren Chava bat Dona, Nir ben Yehudit, Chaya Yael Shoshana Bat Hana Fredo, Lea Sarid Bat Yael Shindo, Shaul Yosef Ben Garaz, and Nir Ben Yaut, and Heleni Orna Bat Chen Hana. Also, the tonight's class will be to the Zivug Hagun, Shosh Nishmatam, to Inbal Bat Jacqueline, Guy Ben Dina. Shina Henshi Bat Lea Geto, Eli Ben Shula, Yehudit Bat Sarah Imenu, Tamar Adina Bat Devora Miro, Ve Yosef Ben Sarah. And also, that this class will be to the general success of the following people, Abraham Ben Daniel, Yosef Ben Daniel, Abraham Ben Violet Chaya, Yehuda Leiv Ben Tova Shindel, a.k.a. Judah Mendel, a good friend from our class, Be'ezat Hashem, we have a lot of atzacha in his new marriage. Also to our good friends Desiree and Avia, and mm-hmm. Yael Teppenberg and family, Joseph Dornbush and the Dornbush family, Dov Shmuel and Pesi Panina and family, and Shalom Ben Chaya Carmela. Plus we have Anonymous, who is sponsoring tonight's class for the Refua Shalema of Shimshon Mordechai Ben Miriam, Yehudit, Yehudit Chaya Bat Eita Lea, Binyamin Ben Chaya, Yaakov Moshe Gershon Ben Zelda Rivka, Eliyahu Ben Homa, Miriam Bat Pesi Penina, Yehoshua Yaakov Levi Ben Devor Miro, and Shiduch Hagun to Yahit Bat Sprints, and also Refua Shalema to our dear friend in that restaurant. Okay, let's get started. This week's parasha, Parashat Behar. Uh, let's read some Pesukim, and from the Pesukim we could start going into the commentary and, um, and start extracting a beautiful life lesson for this week. Vaidaber Adonai El Moshe Behar Sinai Lemor. The, the parasha begins with Hashem speaking to Moshe on Har Sinai. Daber el bnei Yisrael v'matal lehem ki tavo el aretz asher ni noten lachem b'shavta haaretz Shabbat l'Hashem. It says that Hashem instructs Moshe to say, "Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land of Israel, the land that I'll give you, the land itself." should observe a Sabbath. It should rest. And it should rest for the sake of Hashem. Why? Shesh shanim, how? What is the way to go about that? Shesh zanim tizrach sadecha, veshesh shanim tizmo karmecha, vasafta tevuata. It says that for six years you may sow your field, and for six years you may prune your vineyard, and you may, you may gather its crops during that period. However, ובשנה השביעית, שבת שבתון יהיה אל הארץ, שבת לאדוני, שדה חלות יזרע, וחרמך לא תזמור. On the seventh year, 
It shall be a sabbatical year. It shall be complete rest for the land. Shabbat Lashem. It says it's a, it's a, 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 the, the land is going to give its Shabbat to God. Your field, you should not sow. Your, your vineyard, you should not prune. And then it continues to go on uh, in regards to this sabbatical year, year also known as Shemitah. But I'm going to skip to Pasuk Chet and, uh, and go to Yud Bet. And it says, V'safarta lecha sheva shabbatot shanim sheva shanim sheva pa'amim v'ayu lecha yeme sheva shabbatot ha-shanim tesha v'arbaim shana. So this process of six years of working and one year off should be practiced as such. Seven cycles of sabbatical year. Seven years, seven times. The years of the seven cycles of sabbatical year should be for you 49. So seven times seven is 49. So that takes a seven year cycle, seven times, brings you to a total of 49. And that takes you to the next pasuk. Add that time. When we're done counting the 49 years, you shall sound a blast from the shofar. In the seventh month and the tenth of the month, otherwise known as Yom Kippurim, the day of the atonement, you shall sound the shofar throughout the land. And on this 50th year, after counting the 49th years, seven cycles of seven, you blow the shofar and you sanctify the 50th year and you proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. And it should be the Yovel, the Jubilee, year for everyone in the land. And you shall return each man to his ancestral heritage and you shall return each man to his family. That is in regards to people that were sold as slaves. Furthermore, one final pasuk. Yovel hu shnata chamishim shanat yelechem lo tizra'u ve lo tiktseru et sefichea ve lo tiktseru et nezareha ki yovel hu, ki yovel hi kodesh yelechem min hasadeh tochlu et evoata. So it says, it shall be a jubilee year for you, this 50th year. You shall not sow, you shall not harvest, and it's after growth, and you should not harvest its after growth, and you should not pick what was set aside for yourself, for it's a jubilee year. It shall be a holy year to you. From the field you may eat its crop. If this jubilee year shall return each man to his, his ancestral heritage, I want to add one final pasuk. It's pasuk Yudchet that says, V'asitem et chukotai, ואת משפטי תשמורו, ועשיתם אותם וישבתם על הארץ לבטח. You shall perform my decrees and observe my ordinances and perform them. Then you shall dwell securely on the land. Shalom Aleichem. That is the background to what we need to know for tonight's lesson. Tonight's lesson has to do with the year of Shemitah. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the whole concept of Shemitah is a large portion of this week's parasha, and we'll see that there is, even though, that you know everything about it, you know everything, you know everything about Shemitah, but let's see if there's something new that we can come up with, and some, uh, you know, a practical lesson for our day-to-day -day life. So, after this first layer of understanding, let's start to dissect the Pesukim a bit. If we go to the first Pasuk, right away we have a very strange question to ask. We see that Hashem speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu many, 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 many times. And when He speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, He speaks to him, it says, by the Hashem Moshe Lemur. Why is it so unique that all of a sudden, in the middle of Sefer Vayikra, we get this pasuk that says, "Vaydaber Hashem Moshe behar Sinai lemor." That he spoke to, that Hashem spoke to God in the in Har Sinai. Lama Neemar behar Sinai. 
Why is it specifically the, the, the pasuk mentioning Har Sinai? So it tells us, Nilmad shekol haTorah neemra kilotehen ufratehen beSinai. You might think that on Mount Sinai we only had the Ten Commandments and that was it. This pasuk comes to tell us. You see all the details that we're giving you about the sabbatical year. That too was given in Har Sinai. Meaning, if you were under the impression that the only thing that we received on Har Sinai was the Ten Commandments, no, the Ten Commandments and the entire Torah and all its details was given in Har Sinai as well. Furthermore, Rabbeinu Bachia brings, Lefisha Shamu B'nei said Mitzvat Shabbat Gvura, because the Jewish people heard the 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 instruction from a Kadosh Baruch Hu to keep the Shabbat directly from God. He says, just like you heard the, the, the instruction to receive uh, to keep Shabbat Mipiagvura. Similarly are the laws of Shemitah and Yovel, the sabbatical year and the Jubilee, have the exact same importance as Shabbat. Because they too were said in Har Sinai. Everything, meaning we are so connected to Shabbat, and the Shabbat is the holiest day of the week, and nobody could even think about, not, uh, about, about desecrating Shabbat, etc., etc., etc. Nevertheless, the, what Rabbeinu Bachir says, just like you heard to keep Shabbat in Har Sinai, here, there too you heard about Shemitah, there too you heard about Yuvel, and they are just as important as any other mitzvot that were given to us on Har Sinai, and that's why it says over here, by the Be'er Shem Moshe Be'er Sinai, Lemor, that every single mitzvah, both large and small, were all ex- uh, told over on Har Sinai. Yes. You read uh, one small word. It says both tachashibut. Both tachashibut. Shel what? Shabbat. Shabbat. Just like Shabbat is so important, so is Shemitah, so is the Jubilee. Furthermore. Thank you. Definitely. In. It continues to say. That. That this. Shemitah year is called Shabbat Lashem. It's called Shabbat for God, meaning it's a it's a it's a Sabbath for Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So Rabenu Bachia says here again something incredible. Sivta Torah ki b'shana zo lo itnayik b'shum tzad ba'alut al asadeh. On that sabbatical year, year number seven, you can't act as an owner on your field. You can't plow, you can't plant, you can't sow, you can't pick the fruits, you can't bring anything from the field into your home. It has to be as if the field belongs to somebody else. Who does it belong to? It belongs to God. It's imagine you have an entire property that every single day you wake up at 4.30 in the morning. You go to it, you put seeds, you plant, you sow, you water, you, you wait for rain, you pray, you do all these things to, to make it grow, and you're doing it year after year, and it's just a whole process of the agricultural process of taking a seed and turning it into a vegetable or into a fruit, and, and the whole process of actually like picking all of that and turning it into money and turning it into your parnasa, and come, and you're doing that every single day for six years, 365 days times six comes day one of year seven, it's like it's not yours. Because <coughs> if you leave it like, like it belongs to somebody else. Furthermore, the Ramban says, Kmo she Shabbat hi edut le be'a olam shu ba'at ha'olam be'sheshet hi me'a ma'aseh It says, just like the Sabbath serves as a testimony to the world that God created the world. Meaning, when you are walking down the street on Shabbat with your kippah and your fancy suit and you're holding your children's hands and you're going to shul. When the Gentile looks at you, you know what he says? He says, these guys believe that there's a creator. And the creator created the world in six days. 
And on the seventh day he rested, and he told them to rest. And because he told them to rest, they are resting, and they are testimony that there's a creator in the world that told them to rest on Shabbat, and they're doing it as well. I mean, that's, hap- that's what happens on Shabbat. When you're walking out there, you're walking billboard that there is a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and he created the world, and he told us to rest, and we're resting. So just, so the Rabban says, just like Shabbat is that type of testimony, similarly the Shemitah has a similar testimony in the world. The Shemitah comes to be a testimony to something else. That this world is set to be for 6,000 years. And on this, meaning for 6 millennia. On the 7th millennia it's going to rest. Meaning just like the Shabbat is a testimony to the Creator, the Shemitah is a testimony that the world is going to be up to 6,000 years, and the, and the seventh millennia is going to be Kula Menucha Ushvita. It's going to be a year of rest, and there's not going to be any work of the land. Emek says, you might come and try to rationalize. And you might want to say, you know why God said to rest the land on the seventh year? Because it needs rest. It's good for the land. If the land doesn't work for one year, it can recuperate itself, it can recover, and it can be stronger, and it can give more fruit for the next six years. It actually makes sense scientifically, or by, you know, or if you study it, you'll see that when a land rests for one year, it actually works better for the next six. So, Emek Adabai says, Lo bishvil tovat la noach He says, Hashvita, the this, this sabbatical year, is not for the land to rest. Ela The only reason why we have a sabbatical year, because God said so. God said don't, don't work on the seventh year, that's why we do it. Not because it's good for the land, or healthy for the land, or healthy for the crops. Not at all. Even though that it might make sense, and maybe it does make sense, maybe that is a true fact. But when you ask a Jew, why do you rest on the sabbatical year? Why don't you work your field on the seventh year? Because God said so. That's the reason why we do it. No other reason. Furthermore, Mo'uch Hashem, this week, Matoka Ur, the book from Rabbi Shlomo Levenstein, fully loaded, fully loaded with Chidushim. We're going to spend a lot of time on this book. <coughs> Begins to say. A, as the Pasuk says, and this is the famous Rashi that I'm going to read as well. It says that. So the famous Rashi, if you read the first Rashi of the Parsha, it says. My Nyan Shmita, it's a Har Sinai. Why do we have to deal? Because if you see the, if you just read the parasha, the parasha starts, and this is what Hashem told Moshe in Har Sinai, and then the details of the of uh, of Shmita. Rashi asks, what's the connection between Har Sinai and Shmita? Valo kol mitzvot nemru b'Sinai. Didn't all the uh, mitzvot weren't all the mitzvot given over on Mount Sinai? Ela. He says, this pasuk comes to teach us a rule, a law. The rule is, just like Shemitah was given over with all its details and all its parts and all its uh, uh, re- uh, uh, instructions, on Har Sinai, every single mitzvah was given in the exact same way on Har Sinai. So this is something that's interesting, because up until today, I always thought that it was the Ten Commandments. Moshe went up to the heavens. He went back and forth with the Kadosh Baruch Hu on writing down the Torah. And then when he came down, after 120 days, he started to teach the Torah. And the way that he would teach, he would teach Aharon, then after that he would teach Aaron and his children. 
and they would teach uh, I want his children and then his and then the elderly at least four times uh, meaning the elders the zikanim and then they would go and teach the, the 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 nation but we see over here that actually on Har Sinai everything was given over in one shot Rabbi Moshe Feinstein brings an interesting point he says as a Jew when you're performing a mitzvah you don't do it, meaning you should know this as a, you know, the, the rule of thumb, if you're a Jew. That you're not performing a mitzvah because you understand the reasoning behind it. We don't do mitzvot because they make sense. We do mitzvot, and we don't do mitzvot because they have some sort of, uh, you know, they, 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 they sort of like help us or they are of uh, uh, good use for us. The only reason that we perform mitzvot because God commanded us from Sinai so why do I keep Shabbat? God commanded me on Mount Sinai why do I eat kosher? God commanded me on Mount Sinai why don't I wear shatnez? God commanded me on Mount Sinai why do I shake a lulav? God commanded me on Mount Sinai you can give all the reasonings in the world but the real reason of why we do things is because God commanded us what's shatnez? Shatnez is wool and linen together. There's nothing wrong if we learn why. Absolutely, we'll get to that. But default setting, why do I do it? Hashem said Hashem so. Said. I use this rule in my house sometimes. You know, when the kids want to do something, they say, but why? Because Ima said so. Because <laughs> Ima said so. Because if they're not willing to accept a parent, they have to. And to say, yeah, of course, because you wanted to, the child to say that he's not going to do something because Abba said so. Why? Because when he gets an adult, he's going to have to do that as well. He's going to have to do what? Listen to what God is telling him. Why? Because God said so. So it's good chinuch also sometimes to not give him a reason. Even though that it's healthy to give a reason, children need a reason. They need a reason. When you give a child a reason, it settles them. Even if you give them any reason, any reason, as long as you know that there's a reason. But sometimes as part of chinuch, it's also good to tell them, no reason. Abba said so. So they can, you know, so they can be... Uh, uh, they can have that that they have that they sub, subdue themselves for uh, ages in the younger ages the power that they're subdued under is the parents later on as, a, as as an adult you also need to have that you also need to do that you know that's that's anava that's dvekut that's uh, uh, you know all the, the the great midot that people talk about when when a person just does what the what the book says, just does what Hashem wants without asking too much. Those are the greatest people, the greatest <laughs> achievers in our uh, in the Jewish religion. The ones that need answers, we have those too. Right? But it's a different service, a different service of a kadosh baruch when you want answers. Furthermore, if you actually think about this mitzvah of shemitah, it makes no sense. There's no logic to it. What's the reason for it? What's the reason for working six years off on the seventh? What's the reason of the Jubilee? It has nothing to do with logic. It has nothing to do with reasoning. Not only that, at the end of the day, for a person to just desert his property, we don't do that with anything else. There's not a single thing in our life that for one year we say we're deserting it. No, thank you. I want to have nothing to do with it. Somebody, you know, somebody else take over or or or, or have deal. If not somebody else, they go, Hashem, you take over. Yeah. Imagine you open up a store, right? You have a store in the mall. You go to Aventura Mall, you're doing phenomenal business. And then one year you say, Hashem, sabbatical year, I'll see you in one year. What? Well, that's what they did. They had a, and it, they had a business, that was their parnasa, and they just left it. So from here we see, when a person performs this mitzvah of the sabbatical year, he, a Jew does not keep the Shemitah year because he understands the, the reasoning. Rather, only because the Torah commanded us is why we do this sabbatical year. This is a classic example of God commanded us and we do. What's the reason? We don't know. We don't know. So Rav Moshe Feinstein says, so let, let, me, let me explain to you on a deeper level what's the connection of why Shemitah and Sinai are juxtaposed. 
לומר לך, כשם שמצוות שמיטה נאמרה בסיני, just like the, the מצווה of the sabbatical year was fully explained in Har Sinai, and the only reason why we perform it is because we were commanded on Mount Sinai to perform the sabbatical year, ולא משום שיקול טעם אחרי שבעולם, for no other reasoning, ככה עלינו קיים את שאר מצוות התורה. Similarly, this is our approach to performing all the mitzvot of the Torah. That we have no idea why, there's no logic, whether we have a reasoning or we don't have a reasoning, we have an understanding or we don't have an understanding, whether it benefits us, whether it doesn't benefit us, it makes no difference. The same way they performed the mitzvah of Shemitah, because God said so, similarly, every single mitzvah that was told on Har Sinai, we do because God said so. That since this is going against logic of us doing the will of Hashem, and strictly for doing the will of Hashem, this is turning into an Amuna building exercise. Shemitah turns into a, a, an exercise where you just trust God even when it, it's not logical, even when it doesn't make sense to you. Meaning when you go against logic and sense, you need to have emunah in order to do it. When something doesn't make sense to you, why would you do it? Anywhere else in your life you would say, I'm sorry, this doesn't make sense for me, I'm not doing it. Any other area in your life, that's what you would say. But yet, when Hashem says, Sheikh al -ulam, yes sir. Don't work on the seventh year, desert your land, desert. yes sir. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter. Understand that we have that in our religion. There's going to be tons of things that we don't know what's the reason, the rhyme and reason for it, but because God said so, we do it. So even though that we're so good at listening to God without needing reason, but you have to understand that deep down inside, the, the, the motor that's actually making you act that way and giving you the power to be able to be submissive to the Word of God is because you have faith. And we're not. You trust. You believe. If you don't have faith, if you don't trust, if you don't believe, you will not keep the sabbatical year. <coughs> you will not shake a lulav. You will wear wool and linen together. Because when it comes to listening to something that doesn't make sense, you need emunah in order to perform it. So what's happening here with Shemitah, it's coupled with a side order of faith. Emunah and bitachon. You must have it in order to perform this mitzvah. And you must have it to perform all of the mitzvot that have no logic. It's discipline too. Very good discipline. Never, very good discipline. Are we close to the seventh year? Really? I think it just passed like three years ago. So nevertheless, even though that we've just established that over and over and over again, I'd like to share with you some reasons for Shemitah. Just to show you that there are some reasons that when you dig, you can't find. But I wanted to establish the ground level of how we perform mitzvot. Okay. The Chida brings the Chida brings in his book, Lechem Lefiataf. He says in Masechet Brachot, it talks about uh, Rabba. Rabbi was speaking to the rabbis and he tells them, please, I beg of you that on the months of, in the month of Nisan and in the month of Tishrei, don't come see me. Meaning he's a rabbi. He's teaching Torah. And he's telling his congregants, he's telling them, Rabotai, in the month of Tishrei and the month of Nisan, don't come see me. Why? Because if you're going to come and learn Torah with me on Nisan and on Tishrei, the entire year you're going to be worried about your parnasa. The entire year you're going to be worried about how much you're going to be making. <coughs> Why? He says because during these months, that's the months that you have to go work the land. On Tishrei, you plant the seeds. On Nisan, you sow what you, you reap what you sow. And Rabbi knew 
שאם התחכמו ולא עבדו בחדשים האלה בשדה, he says, and if they became uh, defiant, and didn't go to work on Tishrei to plant the seeds, and didn't go on Nisan to, to, to reap what they sow. He says, בסופו של דבר לא תהיה להם פרנסה. At the end that year, they're not going to have livelihood. They're not going to have פרנסה. And because of that, because when a person doesn't have פרנסה, the entire year he won't learn also. Because it's very difficult to sit down and learn when you're broke. When you don't have money in the bank account, All day long you're saying, how am I going to feed the baby? How am I going to pay the rent? The electric. What about the electric? They might turn off the electric. How can you think about a Rashi and a Tosfot if that's in your mind? Lachen, so Rabbah was very smart. Tell them. Adiv she'avdu chodshayim b'shana, u'sho chodshayim b'shana yupnim nimdam. So it's worth it for them that they learn two months, I'm sorry, that they don't learn for two months out of the year, the year that they need to, to, to plant the seeds and to collect the crops, and like that they'll be successful the other ten months of the year to learn. Make sense? Make sense. From here we see that if you take a look at a regular year, that means that the year has ten months of learning and two months of work. And if we're talking about the sabbatical year, we know that you work for six years, and on the seventh month, you're off. On the seventh year, you're off. So, we see that if we take two months of work and no Torah learning, times six years, what does it come out to? Twelve. So in order to make up the twelve months of learning that you miss because of work, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says what? Give me a year of Shemitah. You owe me 12 months of learning. So he says, now take the seventh year and only learn. Give me back the 12. Furthermore, Lechem Lefiatav, we see that actually on the seventh year, they don't work. But it doesn't mean that they're not required to learn. They have to learn. Meaning they have to make up the... 12 months, two months a year, times six, 12 months, they have to make that up on the seventh year. But the seventh year itself also has Torah learning. What about the Torah learning that belongs to the seventh year? So he says something incredible. He says, usually you, you, the, the way you would should, should split up your day is eight hours of work, eight hours of uh, learning, and eight hours, uh, you know, everything else you need to do, sleep, eat, all those different things that, uh, uh, you know, the Rambam says you have to split up your days in, in eights. So he says if you need to learn eight hours a day, plus of the seventh year, and eight hours a day of the years that you miss, the, what happens on the, uh, on the sabbatical year? In the sabbatical year, you learn for 16 hours a day. And now you have what? The, the learning of the sabbatical year, plus the ones that you're, you're uh, making up. That is the calculation of the Hida. Furthermore, in the book, he continues to add another beautiful uh, addition to this. It says, the Torah came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and, it, and the Torah spoke to, to God, and it said, Ribono shel olam, kshikansu Yisrael ha'aretz, zeratz lecharmo, vezeratz lesadehu, vani matehe alai. The Torah says, right before the Jewish people entered the land of Israel, he says, as soon as you give them the land of Israel, each one is going to run to their, uh, to their field, the other one's going to run to his vineyard, and they're going to be so busy working the land, what's going to be with me? What's going to be with the Torah? He says, don't worry Torah, I have a perfect uh, mate for you. I have a perfect mate for you. On Shabbat they don't do nothing, they're always just resting. On Shabbat I'll make it that they learn Torah on Shabbat. So from here we learn that Shabbat was given to us only to learn Torah. However, reality dictates differently. On Shabbat what do we do? We eat, we drink, we sleep. Most of the time. And then we have shul, 
And after we have shul, then how much of Shabbat are you learning? Maybe an hour, or maybe two, maybe three, maybe even less. So, we, uh, you know, people like to do on Shabbat also. They've been working all week. Maybe uh, maybe a, a father wants to play with the kids. He doesn't get to play with them all, Shabbat, all the entire week. Maybe he wants to go for a nice walk with his wife. He doesn't get to do that during the week. So you see that Shabbat, it's a, it's a, some people like to shluk, you know. They like to go and that half hour, hour, two hours. It, uh, it changes the week. It changes the. It's there's a refuah over there. Shena b'Shabbat Anub. So we see that not all the day, by most people, is being used for Torah learning. So what are we going to do? Because the, the, the Torah says you're going to give them the land. They're going to worry. They're going to forsake me. They're going to forget the Torah. So very interesting. You ready for this one? This is a mathematical chidush, but I'll simplify it. It says, We got 52 Shabbatot in a year. And if you take the 52 Shabbatot in one year, and you multiply it by 6, because of the 6 years of work, 52 times 6 is 312. Now, if we take from the sabbatical year, each year is 365 days. If we take away the 52 Shabbatot, so that's 365 minus 52 is what? 312. 312. So it says, He says, if you take a look at all the Shabbatot that we took away during the week, during the year, is 312 Shabbatot in six years. How many, how many days do we have to make up if we take away the Shabbatot of the seventh year? So you get 365, 365 has 52 Shabbatot within it. What's left? 312. Exactly the amount of Shabbatot you need to make up for, for the six years. So why is there a seventh year? To make up for the learning that we're supposed to do on Shabbat because we're working the whole week. An additional learning. Balance it. Yes. Where did I get the six B from? Bed. The Benish Chai's son wrote a book called Tzitzi Mufrachim. He says it's very well known that the entire week gets its power from Shabbat. Kol yemot ha-shavua chayim anu mikuach ha-shabbat. The entire days of the week get their power from the Shabbat. Shehi mekora beracha. We know that Shabbat is the, is the source of all the blessings. Ba'afal pa sh'avda sh'ba Shabbat atzma enenu osim elachat ulav lo pa'in meuma. Even though if you take a look at it, it's very interesting. We do zero work on Shabbat, but yet all the blessings that we get for the entire work week comes from a day that we do no work. The entire blessing that comes for the work week comes from a day that we do no work. He says, similarly, is the seventh year. That is Shabbat Lashem. That is a Shabbat to God. Keshem Kshabbat Shabbat lo osim uma, v'im varechet et kol yemot ha-shavua, just like the Shabbat, we do nothing and it blesses, blesses the upcoming six days of the work week. Similarly is the, is the uh, Shemitah. It's the year that we do nothing and it blesses the upcoming six years. Just like the Shabbat gives power to the six days, the Shemitah gives power to the six years and by doing what? Nothing. Furthermore, just like we're instructed on Shabbat to toil with Torah, similarly, what is our instruction to do during Shemitah? That the, that's, apparently we're so busy from the break of dawn till, till dusk, all we're doing is working the land. There's no time to learn. So that's why the Hashem gives us the sabbatical year so we can that we should actually toil in Torah learning the entire year.
So the sabbatical year is, an, is a time where the Jew that usually works the land actually learns Torah. Furthermore, the Ben Ishchai says, what's another reason for Shemitah? He says, there's a poor man and there's a rich man. And they live two different lives. In order for the rich man to understand the poor man, God created Shemitah. Why? Somebody who's satiated will never feel hunger. Somebody who has money in his pocket does not know what it feels like to be lacking. When that person comes and he has no money and he's begging for money, the rich man doesn't know what that feels like. He understands the person is poor. He understands he needs money. But does he feel it? Does he actually know it? No. A rich man does not know a poor man's uh, tr uh, trials and tribulations or the feelings that they feel inside. That's why the Torah tells us for one year, let your business go. When a person lets go of his entire uh, business, what does he say? I, I, I work in the morning, I come home at night, I, I plant on Tishrei, I pick up on Nisan, that's how it works, that's how I make my Parnassa, that's how I make my living. You asking me to stop my routine. So I do that for six years, but on the seventh year, if I don't do the routine, what's the natural question that a person would ask? Manochal, how can we make a living? Hashem says, feel that. Feel what it's like. How am I going to make a living? Because that's what the poor man feels. The poor man feels, how am I going to make a living? So he says on Shemitah, you get to feel like the poor man. That you don't know where your money is coming from. That's the Ben Ishchai. Furthermore, it's interesting, we said we, 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 Shemitah is just because God said so. But so far we've gotten six incredible uh, reasons of why we do Shemitah, and there's a few more. The Khatam Sofer brings something very interesting about Shemitah. It says, only God is the creator of the universe. And He's the one who watches over everything and everyone and everyone's actions. And as, a, and as the creator of the world, he put himself on the spot. The creator of the world says, and put it on paper, that he promises that anybody who keeps this sabbatical year, that will get rewarded for three years. Meaning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I commanded my blessing on the land. Meaning Hashem spoke to the land, He says, I command you. That when the person keeps Shemitah on the sixth year, you make enough for three years. Let me ask you a question. Who can predict the future? No one. No one can predict the future. But God not only is predicting the future, He's putting a law into the universe. He's, a, he's, he's putting it on paper. He's saying, keep the Shemitah because I said so. And you'll see that the six, every year you get enough for the year. Whatever you plant, you get enough for the year. Whatever you plant, you, get the, you, you, you yield the crop of whatever you planted. On the sixth year, magic. On the sixth year, you get enough for three years. Why? Because you keep Shemitah. Because on the seventh year, you're going to relax and go learn Torah. On the sixth year, I'm going to give you three years. So you have enough for this year, next year, and even the year where you're just starting to plant. Right? Because when you're starting to plant, still no food, right? I got you. I got you. I got you this year. I got you next year. And I got you the year where you come back and you start planting. On paper. Guarantee. Who could do that? Only the Creator. Who could, say, who could prove that to be a, 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 a truth? Only the Creator. The Khatam Sofer says, Im chas v'chalila adam hai maftih ze ma'asmo, if a, if a person would ever give such a claim, you right away see that he's a liar. 
כשהוא he created this promise, you know, he made it out of himself. However, when the Jewish people enter the land of Israel, mitzvah tashmita, the reason why this mitzvah shmita is so important, because you have to understand, let's imagine them, before I read this next line, let's imagine them, 40 years in the desert, surrounded by a cloud, drinking from Be'er Miriam, man me'ashamayim, learning Torah all day long with Moshe Rabbeinu, with the, with the Zekinim, they're just like on a spiritual journey. 40 days and one day, everything changes. They're at the entranceway of uh, the border of Eretz Yisrael, and now, war. Now they gotta become warriors. Now they gotta become fighters. Now they gotta go fight for seven years and divide the land for seven years. 14 years, there's no more, you know, uh, uh, the, the country club in the, in, in the desert. No more, that's done. And after 14 years, seven years of war, seven years of, uh, of division of the land, now let's cut up the land. Everybody go and start. What? Wake up at 4.30 in the morning and start to take out all the thorns and the thistles and all the, all the weeds and start to cultivate the land and then take seeds, put them in the, put them in the ground and go and water them every day. Hopefully this grows. Hopefully this turns into an apple. Hopefully this turns into an orange, right? And all of a sudden you wake up the next day. Okay, and then when they see that little sprout, ah, ah, it's growing. And you saw me working and you, and you know, you come in, it's like hard work, physical work, day after day after day after day after day. And all of a sudden you see that these people are now they, you know, they switched modes. They, they pivoted to being farmers. They were spiritual giants, and now they're what? Now they're agriculturers. Nevertheless, Hashem says, but wait, I didn't take you out of Mitzrayim and give you the Torah so you could be Joe the farmer. You still have to be a spiritual giant. I didn't tell you so you can grow. I didn't take you out of Egypt to grow cucumbers. I took you out of Egypt to work the land because you need to have food and you have to, you know, you have to uh, keep the laws of Shemitah. It's part of the fair. But don't forget Torah. Don't forget the Torah. Don't forget the Torah. Don't forget the Ruchani. Don't forget the spirituality. So that's why he says, Shemitzvah Shemitah Himin HaRayot HaGdolot LaMitut HaToyah Shemitah BeSinai he says, you want to prove that the Torah is truthful? You want to prove that the, the Shatorah emet? Go take a look at my field. Go take a look at my field. Every seven years, I leave it alone. You want to see something unbelievable? Visit me on year number six. Let me show you what three times the crop looks like. <clears throat> oh, why does it happen? Let me show you a book. You turn the Torah. Look, you go to Parashat Behar, Perek Chafalef, Pasuk Aleph, Hashem says... You work the land for six years. On the, on the seventh year, you uh, let it rest. And you get this blessing from the land. There's no, be there's no better way to prove that the Torah is true like looking at the field of somebody who keeps Shemitah. Sharon, wasn't that generation also uh, born in the desert? So they never saw trees? It was like a also? Good point. Also, but does the seven year apply the same way to everybody? Because do they start differently? No, it's a it's a collective. What about the farmers that are growing cattle? We're talking about the land at the moment. There's no prohibition for cattle. No prohibition. Okay. No prohibition. That's on the land. Now, what's interesting? The only, uh, let me give a quick answer. The only thing that we have with the cattle is Peter uh, Korrechem. The firstborn is supposed to be uh, given to, the, to, to God and we have a way of substituting it through money or through, uh, or through sacrifice, but that's the only thing that we have. Maybe one day we'll do a class on it. Right now we're going to talk about the land. So to summarize very quickly, we said, number one, why do we keep Shemitah? Because God said so. 
Why do we do all the mitzvot? Because God said so. That's it. That's us. Blind faith. That's what Hashem wants. That's what I do. By the way, best approach. But if you're a chokhmolog, and I gotta know, I gotta know. That's it. Google generation. I need to know why I do things. Okay. We gave a few reasons. Nice. Some calculations, some numbers, some reasonings. Not a problem. <clears throat> However, recall what we said before. In order to perform the mitzvah shmita, there's a, an accessory, a spiritual accessory that you must have. It's called emunah. If you don't have faith, it's going to be very hard for you to leave your business on that seventh year. And we also said that without faith, it's going to be very hard for you to perform a lot of other mitzvot in the, in the Torah. So that person that is lacking faith in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, when it comes to year number seven, you know what he says? The Pasuk even tells us the words. It says, tomru, And if it comes to the point that you're going to say, Mano chal bashana shvi'it. What are we going to eat on the seventh year? Where, how am I going to live? How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to keep the lights on if I don't go to work on year number seven? Well, we're not going to plant and we're not going to gather our crops. And Hashem says, here's the guarantee. Hashem says, I commanded my blessing upon the land that on the sixth year you'll get crops that will last you three years. This question of what are we going to eat on the seventh year? Why are you asking that question only on year number seven? Why only on year number seven you ask that question? Why don't you ask that question, what am I going to eat on year one? What am I going to eat on the first year? Why am I not going to eat, what am I going to eat on the second year? You know why you don't ask those questions on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth year? Because you think you're in control. I plant, I water, I take care, I, uh, I reap, I sell, I make I am in control. Aye, aye, aye. But the minute you let go of what you have to do, all of a sudden, Maruchan, how can we make money without me? <laughs> if it wasn't for me, if it wasn't me waking up at 4.30 in the morning, how, how are the babies going to eat? Who's going to have the formula? Who's going to keep the lights on? That question, Manochal, is an everyday question. It's a year one question. God is the one who controls the crops, the success of the crops, and what Parnassah you make. But the person who doesn't ask that question for six years and only wakes up on the seventh year is a sign that he's lacking and Muna and Vitachon in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and he's more leaning on himself. So don't ask. Don't ask? That's the best way to be. Again, when you have, uh, we'll get to it. I, you know, you, you're saying a good point, but I have it like a diamond coming up. So we'll save it for a diamond. <clears throat> now, the Sforno and Malbim, the Sforno and Malbim explain to us, what do you mean that the blessing will be for three years? He says there's two ways to look at it. It all depends on the person. It says, one, one person needs a tremendous amount of shefa that will legitimately hold up for three years. Meaning there's one person that he's going to need to see this blessing as the crop on the sixth year giving the, the quantity of three years. He's good. He's a good Jew. He has emunah. He has bitachon. He, does, he keeps the shemitah. And he knows that he needs food for three years. And Hashem makes it for that person the size of three years. However, there's another one, a different type, that is more miraculous. That the crop that the sixth year brings is like every year. But somehow, miraculously, it lasts for three. It says that even he eats, and with a little bit, he satiated like he ate big. So the little bit that he has actually lasts him very long. It says, I gave you the crops for three years. 
יאכלו במשך שלוש שנים. השם will make it that the amount that you eat in three years will be enough for just the food of one year. משום שהם ראויים לנס. Why? Because those people with that type of אמונה are worthy of a miracle. והתבואה תתברך במאה אוכלים אותה. And where is the blessing going to come? The blessing is going to come in the belly of the people. When they eat it, inside the belly, there's going to be, Hashem is going to make, Savea. Uh, uh, two bites, Savea. Yeah, I have so much left over. I have so much food. However, let's go back to that individual that says, Manochal, what are we going to eat? Why does he say that? Why did that individual wake up on the seventh year and says, what am I going to eat? Chaser midat habitachon shelo. He's worried. He's worried, how am I going to make Parnassa this year? Ah, you don't have Bitachon. So, how did you make Parnassa last year? How did you survive two years ago? And three years ago? And five years ago? And 20 years ago? Now? Now you, you, now you have fear? But if he has had three times the harvest on the sixth year, he doesn't have any worry for the seventh year because he already has the food there. And that's why this particular person that says Manuchal, he's the one that gets it for three years. This person that is worried, he needs the, to see the three years worth of grain that's going to be worth it for him. Why? Because the other one who has more emuna gets the same. What, what's a bigger miracle? What would you say is a bigger miracle? I don't know. I, I can't decide for myself. But what's a bigger miracle? Seeing that the sixth year crop gives you the quantity of three years, or that the sixth year crop stays the same in the last three years? Which miracle do you like better? The second one. You like the second one? The same, same. Same? I like the second one. I like the third one. I like the third one. To each his own. The Shem Yehud Kudush Hashem Kudush Yitav Shem Yisrael Bechat Adonai Elohim Mecha Olam Yem Baruch. Amen. Okay, now I have a beautiful, okay, uh, here we go, we're shifting gears, okay, we did the, we did a little bit of the ground level, we got a little bit of, uh, you know, some uh, ta'amim, reasons for the Shemitah. We got some basic understandings that emunah and Hashem, we don't need, uh, uh, we don't need any reasonings. We gave some reasonings. Uh, we understand that there's a, the, 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 this Shemitah is not just something for, you know, there's a lesson here, not just for a farmer. There's a lesson for us here as well. But here is going to be, uh, you know, where we shift gears to understanding of how to activate what we're learning. Because you have to understand that emunah is a power. And you have this power, all of us, every single person in this room has this power to interact with God in such a way. So here we're going to learn about emunah. And at the end of the class, a mega bonus from Shvila Pinchas. Emunah is the The mitzvah of Shemitah, its purpose is to strengthen our heart and our faith in God and our trust in Him. When a person reveals himself, exposes himself, when a person says, Man no chal What are we going to eat on the seventh year? He exposes himself to be the problem. That the problem is not which food are we going to eat on the seventh year. The problem is what's going on with your emunah? What's the problem? With, what, 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 you know, what level is your emunah on that you're asking this question at seven, on the seventh year? You're living out straight miracles for six years straight. How do you have this question in the seven years? The problem is not the food, the problem is you. As we say every single day, and, and you have, when you say this, you have to believe it. In Asher Shvebetech, we say it three times a day. Let's explain this. You know that thing, that part in shul where people open up their hands to God? 
You have some guys that, you know, that open up like this. Some people open up like this. Some people you see, they smack their next door neighbor. Everybody has their own shita of how to do it. Listen to the text. The eyes of all your creations are raised to you. Waiting. Where's my parnasa? Where's my food? Where's my sustenance? Everyone. From an ant to a worm to a cat to a dog to a lion to a human being. Everybody, everybody turns their eyes to God. Feed me. Take care of me. Sustain me. All of creation turns to one for their, for their uh, existence. What's the second part of the pasuk? Ve'ata noten lahem et ochlam. And you are the one that gives them sustenance. Not your boss. Not your brother. Not your sister. Not your, your wealthy friend. Not the, the, the gvir of the shul. The, the rich man of the shul. Ve'ata. You, God, you're the one that gives the entire world their sustenance. The last word is, is, the, is the key word over here. At its proper time. When Hashem wants to give Parnassah to me, it's not the same time He wants to give Parnassah to him or her or the other one. Everybody has a different payout schedule. Let's say it again. All the eyes of all creations turn to you for their sustenance. Veata, you are the one who is feeding the whole world. You are the one. You are the boss of all bosses. And you are the one that gives everybody their sustenance when? Beito. So when he closes a deal for a quarter of a million dollars and you can't pay the rent, that's his aito. That's his money. That's his time. No jealousy. No ainara. He has his own program with God. And when yours comes, yours will come. And when you're supposed to get yours, you're supposed to get yours. That's why Hashem gives the, uh, sustains the world. And maybe that person that says, forgot that. He forgot the potach et yadecha. You know which, what he does? This guy opens up his hand and says, a million dollars. <laughs> he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, it's, it's like a, a Make-A-Wish Foundation. I wish for a million dollars. <laughs> you're not connecting, you're not connecting. What do you, you still think you're in control? This is like, what is this, the hard rock? You wish for a million, maybe you'll get it. It's a, it's a lottery. Talk to God. Connect to the words that you're saying. I'm turning to you, God, because only you can feed me. Only you can take care of me. And you are the one that is that's giving me sustenance. And I know it's at its proper time. You're one, you're two, you're three, you're four, you're five, you're six, and you're seven. Ah, the moon of life. There he is. That's a real Jew. The guy who asks, Man ochal b'shana shvit, forgot that. The Ramban says, That if that is the case, if God is the one that's providing us with our sustenance and our parnasa, then what do I have to do? Apparently, it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me putting the seed in the ground and watering it and, 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 and uh, uh, reaping the, the crops. Nothing to do with me. God is in control. He's the one that cuts the check. So why do I have to do anything? Do I have to do anything if God is in control? If God is the one who's cutting the checks? So the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, Nachman, he says, Al ha'adam mutelet rak chovat ishtadlut. Yes, God is the one who is going to be the one that makes the crop successful, and He's the one that's going to make it grow, and He's the one that's going to make it uh, a, a good crop, and you'll be able to sell and you get part aside, and you get your livelihood from it. But you have a part in it. What's your part? Hishtadlut. You must make an effort. And says, and know that your efforts that you're making 
are not the efforts that are creating the results. Hashem just wants you to move. Do something. Do something towards your parnasa. But don't think because you did it that that's why you got the, you, you, you got the end result. The end result is always because of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Because it, there's a thing that we have to watch out for. It's kohi ve'otzem yadi asal yet achay lazem. You can't have the attitude, the ideology, that it's my strength, my power, my phone call, my email, my idea, my invention, got me this mansion, got me this Lamborghini, got me this, uh, this Rolex, got me this beautiful life, got me this fat back account. Birkat Hashem, hita ashir. God's blessing is what creates uh, wealth. Hashem's blessing is what makes you rich. Not your actions. So what am I supposed to do? Hishtadlut. Make that phone call. Come up with, the, with that idea. Send that email. Plant that seed. Do something. But just know, humble yourself, that the end result is because God decided. And God gives. Not from your handiwork. You just... It's your responsibility. It's your, the, the onus is on you to do ishtadut, to do an action. And he says, okay, fine. Ma midata ishtadut? To what extent? How much of an effort do I have to make? Do I have to make a lot? Do I have to work for 18 hours a day? 12 hours a day? 8 hours a day? 6 hours a day? 4 hours a day? 2 hours a day? 1 hour a day? Or half hour a day? Five minutes a day? What is the ishtadlut? How much do we have to work? Because we see people go to work. Some people leave in the morning and come back late at night. Some people have a nine to five. Some people work for one hour on their iPhone. And every single person is making parnasa. So what's the difference between the guy that's working for bumper to bumper 18 hours... The guy that's got the regular nine to five and the guy that's just working for a few hours. What's the difference between all of them? Emunah. Emunah. And this is what the rabbi is going to explain over here with a beautiful story. He says, Midat ishtadlut. He said, Kehosh emunata shadam chazaka vamititote, the more that a person has emunah and it's strong and it's real, ketana midat ishtadlut shalav. You only have to make a little bit of effort. He said you can even come to the reality that when a person has faith in God, he doesn't even have to do a shtadlut. And make an effort. However, to sit on the couch and do nothing and get a paycheck is not a reality. What they're saying over here, the Ramban is saying, Kedeli skot shelema. In, he says to get to the point where you don't have to make any effort to making money, you have to make a tremendous amount of effort on your spirituality. You have to have, be at a spiritual height that the money comes to you already. Meaning don't think that you say, you know, you could take a, any regular guy who's lazy, doesn't want to work, can't find a job. He sits on the couch and he says, I believe in God. <laughs> he will do anything and everything for me. I believe in him. Okay? One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, he's going to get tired, right? There's no checks in the mail. What happens? If you're, not a, you know, if you're not a spiritual giant that you can do that, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. It's actually, it's a sin to do something like that, to put yourself in such a situation and your family. But we're learning over here a master key. The bigger your emunah is, the more faith and trust you have in God, the less you have to work. There's a story from Al Sheikh HaKadosh. His students asked him about Ishtadlut, about Bitachon. He says, We heard about this concept that if you have Bitachon, if you have faith in God, that you can get to the point that you can have faith, so much faith, that you don't have to make any um, effort. And at that time, when his students asked him this question, there happened to be a simple Jew over there that his work was uh, delivering uh, cement. What do you call cement before it's cement? Sand. What do they call it? Sand. Concrete. 
Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concrete. Concr
he found deep in the ground a huge treasure chest filled with gold and diamonds. He, he went down into the pit. He filled up all his bags with the outside. He put it into the carriage. And all of a sudden, there was almost like a, a mudslide from where he was. And he fell into the pit. He got covered by the clay and he died. The Gentile, the, Sweet death. the Gentile that bought the donkey and the carriage went into the field to, to get building materials. He was digging for clay. He found the clay. After the, he, he saw over there the treasure chest filled with gold, filled with jewels. He went, he filled it up. He put it onto the, onto the carriage. And then as he's about to leave, there was a, a mudslide that, dry, that sort of like put him into the pit, covered him up with mud. And he died. And now you have over there the donkey, the carriage, and the gold. The donkey knows only one place to call home. He looks left, he looks right, he sees that there's nobody there, starts walking. He starts walking, and where does he go? All the way back home. Now, when they see that the donkey was back, they say, what? What, what, what's going on over here? They went outside and they see that the donkey is back and he's there with the carriage and they saw that in the back were sacks and sacks of gold. They were so overwhelmed and, and, and with emotion that the wife and the children came to their father. He thought for sure they're coming to yell at him again because they've been yelling at him week after week after week, go to work, go to work, go make some money. He thought that he's coming to yell at him again. But this time the family came to him with Simcha Gedola, with a big joy and happiness, and says, He says, wow, it really worked for you. Your 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 your, your, your bitachon in God was so great that eventually that that treasure, that, that payout that you're waiting for, it's at your doorstep. It's right here. But So when this happened. Obviously, the, it was told in the entire town. And the students of the al Sheikh said, Rabbi, we were there when you told the story. And you were there when you told us she, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a reality of bitachon blish tadud, that somebody can have enough bitachon and kadosh, but oh, they doesn't need to do any sort of uh, additional actions in order to uh, get his livelihood. We were there. And he was there. He overheard the lesson. Why did he merit to this reward and we didn't? He says, Why, why is it that he got merited and us, we didn't? So Sheikh HaKadosh gives him a mashal, he gives him a parable. He says, there's a person that could take a stick, could take a staff, and he puts it into the ground, but the ground is very tough. It's very tough to get that stick into the ground. However, even though that it's, it's, it's difficult, the person fights and fights and fights and fights and eventually he's, he's uh, successful and the stick is going to stand on this hard part of the ground and nobody will be able to move that stick from there. He says, in complete contrast, there's, uh, there's uh, a muddy uh, uh, part of the ground that if you put a staff into it, it's easily going to go in and easily be taken out. He says this simple man, the reason why he was able uh, to receive this miracle is because he puts, it was very, 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 very difficult for him to believe that. But he fought and he fought to believe in it until it became a reality. You couldn't take him out of it. It's not like a stick in the mud. You go in, you try, you don't like it, you take it out. A lot of people are like that. That's the approach. They try a day, week, two days, okay, I'm out. He didn't. It was hard. It's hard to put that stick into a, uh, into a hard uh, piece of uh, ground. And he was able to do it. But once it's inside, it's hard to take it out. He says that was his approach. He says somebody who has behemet, ironclad, real strong emunah, or midat it becomes a reality. The wife? The wife was the one that sold the tongue? Yes. Yeah, he knew that. They knew. I want to touch on one other point. It says, "Ma nochal b'shana hazot." 
בשנה השביעית. It's very interesting, sometimes the answers are inside the question. When a person says, מה נאכל בשנה השביעית? What will we eat on the seventh year? If you take the first letter of the two words, מה נאכל, it spells out מם נון, מן. מה נאכל, מן. What does it mean? Beautiful חידוש. Remember, that 40 years in the desert, what did they eat? Man. Man. That's heavenly food. Angelic food came down from the heavens. Parnasa ze mishamayim. What you earn comes from the heavens. Your sustenance, your livelihood comes from the heavens. So when you get to the person of man lochal, if you ever get to the, to the point in your life where you say, what am I going to eat? What are you supposed to think about? Mem nun. Nun. Man. Think about the man. How did Hashem sustain uh, millions of people in the desert? In the desert. He was able to do it for 40 years. What's your problem? What happened? You have a mortgage bill? What is it? Electric bill is missing? Manocha? You asking Manocha? You're, you're, you're the, uh, the, 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 the ancestor, you're the, the, the offspring of all the, the, all the, all the Adol before, all the way from the, from the time of the desert. And they believed in God, they went to the desert, and He was able to sustain them in the desert. Manuchal, you're asking Manuchal, you're supposed to have the emuna of those Jews. As a matter of fact, they say that um, when a person gets married, we have a custom to break the glass. Right? They break the glass, mazal tov, right? So I saw it brought somewhere that the Chatan is supposed to think that that glass represents the Tzintzenet Haman. What's the Tzintzenet Haman? Remember, there was a jar, that in that glass jar, they kept a sample of the man, and it was put inside the Arona Kodesh. So he says, why should the Chatan think that this is the jar of the man? He says, why? Because maybe he's 20, 22, 24, 25, whatever it is, a young guy, just finished Yeshiva. Or maybe even a guy who's getting married in his later years, right? What happens? He's standing under the chuppah, and what does he see? He sees 200, 300 people. He's like, wow, who's paying for all this? <laughs> huh? He looks to the right, he sees, wow, I have to take care of this one now. I have to take care of this stuff. For the rest of my life, I've got to take care of her. Where am I going to get all this money from? So the time, think about the tzintzenet of the man. Man ochal. <laughs> Break the glass, have the faith that HaKadosh Baruch Hu provides even in the desert. Man ochal, man. Remind you, every time you come to the point where you ask yourself, how am I going to pay my bills? Remind yourself, you're the son of the God that feeds the, the Jewish people, man from the heaven. You're, you're, you're from that group. So have faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Furthermore, In, if you recall, I added one last pasuk, which was Chafeyu Chet. Vasitem et chukotai, veet mishpatai tishmeru. Yeah. Vasitem otam, veyashavtem ala eretz habetach. In this pasuk, it says that Hashem says, perform my decrees, observe my ordinances, and perform them, meaning the ones you understand, the ones you don't understand, tishmeru. Keep them. Perform them. And what do you get as a reward? What's the reward you get as a Jew for going in the way of God? You'll dwell on the land securely. Now, maybe this is like a sensitive issue because in Israel, everybody wants us off the land. They're giving us a hard time, right? Imagine that we're in Israel. And nobody bothers us. Nobody's trying to get any people out of Timbuktu. Nobody. Nobody's coming to try to push people out of Australia. Nobody. You don't see any sort of movement, anybody trying to get rid of Canadians. Nowhere. Us? Notice how many times have been kicked off the land, kicked off the land, kicked off the land, kicked off the land. Why? So we have to come back. Why did we get kicked off of the land? Because we sinned. We're a product of our choices. 
We went off the derech. We did not keep Hashem's chukot and mishpatim. We did not observe the ordinances and we did not perform the mitzvot. And that's why we don't have the Yashav Temalai Tzaveta. And that's why we're not sitting securely on the land of Israel. No, I'm not. We have what? We have people on top of us telling us it's my land. I've been here. I was here before. I'm first. I'm first. It's like kids. Do you ever see kids? They love to be first on everything. I was here first. I was here. Wow, what wars over being first. <laughs> this is what's happening over here. It's the Jews and the Arabs. I was here first. I was here first. Uh, this guy shows a picture of his grandfather on the land from 1967. And we show him a picture of Shlomo Ahmed of 3,000 years ago. Okay, I was here first. Uh, and there's no end to it. Why? Because there's nothing to do with them. Hashem just puts them into our lives to bother us. To wake up, like, aren't you sick of these guys already? Don't you want to just sit comfortably in the land? Yeah, this week's parasha tells you, oh, you want that? Then go back. Guarantee, you'll securely sit on the land. On this particular... Uh, <coughs> okay. yeah. On this particular uh, pasuk... So, uh, Rebenu Bachye asks a question. What kind, of a, what kind of a blessing is this? That we should sit securely on the land. He says, Al ish mirata golim. He says, you know why this pasuk is inserted here when it's connected to Shemitah? He said, I'll tell you why. Because when you don't keep the Shemitah, you get kicked off the land. If you keep the Shemitah, you'll securely live on the land of Israel. You don't keep the Shemitah, you get kicked out. You might not know this, but when the Jewish people finally, finally uh, moved into the land of Israel, the first Bet HaMikdash was built for how many years? 420. And after the destruction of the first temple, the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon for 70 years. You know why? Chazal tell us the reason why the Jewish people were kicked off of the land is because they didn't keep, sh did not keep 70 Shemitot. Let's do the calculation. You have 70 Shemitot, 70 sabbatical years that were not kept. So that means you multiply 6 times 70. What's 6 times 70? 420. 420. How many years was the first Bet HaMikdash built for? 420. 420. That means how many, if they, did, if, if, they, if they missed it for 70 times, then they owe God 70 years. How many years would they exile to Babylon? 70 years. That's this Pasuk. It says that when you don't keep the Shemitah, you are going to get exiled. Lachen. That's why That's why the guarantee, the blessing of being securely on your land is connected to the Jew living in Israel and keeping the Shemitah. Furthermore, I have a beautiful book over here called Classics and Beyond. A good friend of mine gave it to me. He brings here something incredible that I want to share. And then we're going to hear, uh, we're going to learn from Masechet Brachot. So, I, I, you know, I just want to give a disclaimer. If anybody needs to leave, please, I'm not holding you hostage. Certain lessons need to go long because you have to start from the beginning and you can't finish till you get to the final point. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. I do have about two or three more books I want to go through. But if you have to leave, please, I totally understand it's late. We but if you don't have to leave, you have a Munah, you stay. You have a Munah, you stay? <laughs> and just, you know, like in the summertime, the class is starting late. They go late. I don't want to... Okay, I gave the disclaimer. Please now. Okay. Chazal in Masechet Arachin on the 30th page on the second side says, Why are the laws of Shemitah and Yovel juxtaposed with the section that deals with one that goes through an ascending level of poverty. Meaning if you read the parasha, 
right after we finish talking about Shemitah and Yovel, it's going to talk about somebody in, in, in society that is going to start going down in their finances. All of a sudden they can't afford their bills, now they need help, now they're borrowing, now they're selling themselves a slate. Like, what happened? Why is Shemitah and Yovel juxtaposed to a person going down on his luck, losing money? That's what this Masechet uh, Arachim talks about in uh, the 30th page on the second side. It says, a person who refuses to abide by the restrictions of the Shemitah and the Yovel, and instead he hoards it with intention to selling the crops of the seventh year, and he thinks he made a financial killing. Why? Everybody's not working. I'm the only one selling. What? Monopoly. Nobody's got these apples. Do you buy them for a quarter? I thought for a dollar. I'm going to be a multi, multi-millionaire this seventh year. All of you can follow it. You guys, uh, religious Jews. Yeah, go ahead. You follow that. I'm a businessman. I'm shrewd. I'm smart. I see an opportunity when I... Uh, a good opportunity... A par- a par- I see a good opportunity when I see one, and I'm going to take advantage of it. So he sells in the seventh year. So he thinks he's going to make money. What, so why is a person going down on his luck juxtaposed to uh, Shemitah and Yovel? Because the Torah starts to describe what happens to that individual. The person becomes impoverished. He requires financial assistance. He requires relief. And then after that, if he doesn't get the message, he starts to not profit from the Shemitah crops, but rather he starts to lose money. And after he starts to lose money, he has to sell all the movable goods. He's got to sell the Ferrari. He's got to sell the, the jewelry. And if he doesn't take the hint that it's because of the Shemitah, then what happens? He starts to lose more. Now he has to sell the field that he's made the crops on. And if he doesn't get his lesson and he still continues in his way, then what happens? Now he has to sell his house. And this da- downward spiral continues until he needs to borrow money with interest. And after he borrows money with interest, he, he ultimately even sells himself as a slave. So we see that the reason why Shemitah and Yovel is juxtaposed to a person deteriorating in his financial status is to tell us the progression of punishment that awaits the person violating the Shemitah laws. So not only does a person go down in his finances, but also gets exiled from the land. There's a Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin. I want to learn it with you. It says, Masechet Kedushin on the 20th page on the first side, it says, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Hanina Omer, Bo re'e kama kashe avka shishvit. He says, come, let me teach you how difficult and tough somebody who messes around with uh, uh, forsaking the, the sabbatical year. Even the avka, even the, 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 the dust of the sabbatical year, look what happens. Adam no seven oten be perot shviit le sof mocher metal telav. He says somebody who who wheels and deals with the crops of his um, of the seventh year, he eventually sells all his uh, metal telav, all the things that are not real estate, but like his car, his jewelry, all the things, the movable objects. Lo yergish, he doesn't pay attention, he doesn't wake up. Le sof mocher tzadotav, he sells his uh, his field. He says it deteriorates until he sells his house. And then he not only sells his house, he even sells his own daughter as a slave in order to make money. And if that's not enough, he'll go and borrow for money with interest. He eventually deteriorates to a level where he has to sell himself as a slave in order to stay alive. And even he deteriorates to a level that he is even willing to sell himself to an idol worshiper. We know that as a slave, we only sell ourselves to another Jew, because another Jew has the laws of, uh, of, uh, of an Ebed, and we, and we treat him properly. Imagine a Jew that sells himself to a Gentile. Gentiles have no rules for slaves. They don't have any rules of how to treat him properly. So imagine what, with a deterioration of a person when he doesn't keep the Shemitah laws. How it, it, It's a downward spiral. 
So, even though that we said in the beginning of the class that, is, that we keep the Shemitah year because Hashem said so, He commanded us, that's why we do it. We can see that the sabbatical year is used as a tool. It's a tool that Hashem uses to balance a Jew from his work life and his spiritual responsibility. We see that you have to work six years and then you owe all that time that you were missing for Torah learning. So Hashem creates a day like Shabbat or a year like the Shemitah year where a person makes up for all the lost Torah. Because you can't be all work and you can't be all learning. There has to be a balance. How do we know that? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Ishmael had an, uh, discussed this in a, in a Masechet, in a Gemara. I'll, uh, I'll bring it in a second, but I just want to show you that if you pay attention, that we have similar, a smaller version of the Shemitah on a weekly basis. We work six days, we rest on the seventh. We need that spiritual recharge. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us that one day. He says, stop, recharge, add Torah to the week. The Torah is what's going to give you the power and the bracha to be successful for the upcoming week. Similarly in Shemitah, work six years, give me that one year, full year of Torah learning. That's what's going to give you the blessing for the entire uh, six upcoming years. And then we said that we also had in this week's parasha, the Jubilee, the Yovel, that you go through these uh, cycles of seven years, seven times, it yields 49 years. And on the final year is Yovel. And we see that when a person keeps the Shabbat and the Shemitah and the Yovel, the Sabbath, the sabbatical year, the Jubilee, what happens in the Jubilee? They say that they blow the Shofar on Yom Kippur and everyone goes free. Interesting that the whole end, the whole end of this whole process of Shemitah ends at year 49 and you get this 50 year of freedom. I'm free. Great. What now? What do I do? Check yourself into Yeshiva. Go learn. Hmm. Everything that has to do with freedom is some way, somehow always connected to Torah. For those of you that are connected to the... Um, that are connected to the time that we're in. We're learning Pirkei Avot. There's a very famous Pirkei Avot that talks about what is freedom. As a matter of fact, we could even see a small microcosm of the sabbatical years of the 7 times 7 to 49 and then the freedom of Torah learning in the Omer. We have 7 weeks, 7 times. The 50th day is Shavuot. What do we get on Shavuot? Matan Torah. You see that the freedom comes with Torah. There's a big, big connection to freedom and Torah. Pirkei Avot, on the sixth chapter, in the second Mishnah, says, it talks about the Luchot. It says that, that the way that the Luchot were written, Harut, that it was etched onto the tablets. So the word harut is etched, right? Like as if it's carved in. The Mishnah Pirkei Avot says, harut, harut. Don't read the word as harut, which means etched. Read it differently as harut, which means freedom. You have no one who is a free person. Rather, the one that, that toils in Torah learning. Who is free? The one who learns Torah. The Torah gives you freedom. So if you're a slave to the grind, if you're in the rat race, if you don't want to burn out, if you want to break free, how do you break free in this world? Check into Shabbat. Check in into Shemitah. Check into Yovel. Recharge yourself. Recharge yourself with freedom. Freedom that comes from Torah learning. Furthermore, you'll, you'll notice that what's really happening over here is God is teaching us how to have a balanced life. You got to go to work. 
bills got to get paid. But you also are a servant of God. And you can't ignore that. Very, very famous machloket in the Gemara, Masechet Brachot, on the 35th page on the second side, we have a machloket between Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, I wanted to read it from the inside, but I'm just going to do it on the outside. Okay? Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, so I want to understand, you're going to plant the seeds, you're going to water the, the, the plant, you're going to cultivate it, you're going to take care of it. You're going to, uh, you know, you're, you're going to uh, 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 reap uh, all the crops. You're going to go sell it. You're going to go turn it into money. What exactly are you going to learn Torah? He says, you're, the, you're a Jew. Your job is to learn Torah. If you're going to go be a, a farmer, when is there going to be a time for Torah learning? Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel tells him, well, maybe we should do half and half. Maybe the person should learn Torah and also go to work. So it says over there, I'll just read the... It says over there. Amar Abaye, Harbe Asuker Bi Ishmael, Ve'ala Be'adan, A lot of people went in the way of Rabbi Ishmael, where they worked and they learned Torah, and they were successful. He says, and a lot of people went in the way of Rabbi Shimon by Yochai, which is learning all day long, and they were not successful. So we see that in this world, what needs to be done? You have to be half day working, Oh, I'm sorry. You have to be both working and learning. Shemitah comes to teach us balance. That if you're going to be in this world, you can't be work all the time. And you also can't be learning all the time because not everybody has the head to sit down. Not everybody can be a spiritual judge. Not everybody can sit in the kolel. And it seems like the majority of people need to go to work to support their family. But they can't forsake in their Torah either. So you must have a balanced life. You must learn on Shabbat. You must learn in the morning. You must learn at night. If you're, if you're a farmer, if you've got to work six years, then you've got to give that, that sabbatical year. It's a full year where you check yourself into the, into the yeshiva. Why? Because that's what's going to work for the neshama that's inside of you. You can't starve your spirituality. You can't starve your neshama. You have to feed it. For the, for, the, for the majority of us, what's the good spiritual diet? Well, we know most men check themselves into a shul every morning. Some people learn a little bit before prayer, and they pray. Some people pray and learn a little bit after prayer, but then they take care of the morning. Then they work the entire day, and they are getting credit as if they learned the entire day. Why? Because the entire day, they are living out what they learned. They're, they learn to be honest in business, so they live out being honest in business. They learn to eat kosher food, so their lunch is kosher food, and their coffee is kosher, and their snacks are kosher, meaning whatever they learn, they're living out. So it counts for them that the entire time that they're living out the Torah life, it's as if they've been learning the entire day. All you have to do is connect the dots to Mincha and Arvid, that over there you pray your tefillah of the afternoon and night time, Learn something else at night, and there it is, 24 hours. 24 hours, it counts for you as if you're learning. Because even sleep counts for you as learning. Because why? Because you're resting in order to wake up tomorrow to support your family and to learn Torah. So we said, oh, just a little bit of work, a little bit of uh, a Torah. No, no, no. You can get 24 hours worth of Torah while you're working, while you're sleeping. As long as you're performing what you're learning. It's all about having balance. As a matter of fact, I saw a beautiful Pirkei that I want to share with you guys. This is, this is real talk. It says, Rabban Gamliel, Benosh Rebbe Yehuda Nasi Omer. Rabban Gamliel, who was the son of Rebbe, Rebbe Yehuda Nasi. Yafet Talmud Torah, Im Derech Eretz. He says, it's good to learn Torah and to be busy with a job. It's good to have both. 
Why? Sheyegiat shenehem meshakachat avon. When you're busy with work, and when you're busy with Torah, there's no time to sin. I love this one. I'm going to read it again. So nice, we had to say it twice. It's good to be a Torah learner that is also busy with work. When a person is busy with work and busy with Torah and has no more extra time, he's not able to sin. There's no time to sin. From here, this is the greatest life lesson you could ever have. Get a job that takes up your time. Whatever time is left over, learn Torah. And you'll, you'll be sin free. As a matter of fact, when we talk about balance, balance is when everybody gets what they need. For those people that are married and have a family, then you have to add a third layer. It's God, family, work. You have to give Hashem and the Torah learning. That's a Jew. Hashem redeemed us from Egypt as being slaves to be His spiritual servants. That's it. We signed the contract. We agreed. Save us from here, we'll be your spiritual servants. We are under contract. We have to serve God. That's one third of the day. We have to go support the family. That's another third of the day. Then you've got to spend time with your family. That's the last third of the day. You have to have balance. Shemitah comes to teach us that you can't have just a work life and you can't have just a spiritual life. You need to have balance in your life. We thought we were starting to learn something about something that pertains just to a farmer. And what could we really extract as a lesson from, from the lesson of Shemitah in Parashat Behar? But rather, it's giving us the formula to success as individuals, as parents, and as Jews. I want to conclude, and I saved a lot of time by not going into the Gemara, with a Shvile Pinchas. This won't take more than two or three minutes. But this is a game changer. This entire lesson was an introduction to this last piece. Everything that we learned is just so you can understand this last piece clearly. It says, Emunah, the master tool. Just in the, for those of you that were in our last class of the ladies' class, Emunah Life, unbelievable series. I recommend it for men and for women. Press play over and over and over again on all the classes. Each one is a masterpiece about how, uh, uh, yeah, how to interact with God with emunah in this world. Mamash, highly recommended. Shvila Pinchas brings Rabbi Pinchas Friedman. Emunah sinor hamamshich et ha-shefa milamala. Emunah is the pipeline that draws all the abundance from up above. Meaning, there's a big piñata in the Shemaim. It has everything that you want. Everything. Everything that you want. Your husband, your children, your money, your health. Everything is there. Now you want to draw it down. So, how do you draw it down? Nimal piñata, you, you hit it with a stick. When you're a Jew, it's different. You create a pipe. It's called uh, Emuna pipe. And you... Put it into the pinyana and the shamay, mm -hmm. and it draws all the all the abundance to come down from up above. It's the emuna pipe, as it says in the book Ohev Israel from Rav Yechiel Michal Mizalchov. He says, emuna has two definitions. The plain definition of emuna, of emuna is that I believe it's going to be as such that, that I believe faith. Emunah, basic interpretation, basic definition of the word emunah, faith, to believe, to trust. He says, but there's an alternative definition that we can learn from Megillat Esther, from the Pasuk that says, Vayi oman et hadasa. We know that Mordechai raised uh, Esther, and the word that Megillat Esther uses for him grooming her, raising her, uh, uh, you know, Educating her, oman et hadasa, and he says that the true definition of the word oman lashon hamshacha vegidul is to draw and to enlarge, or to draw or to uh, increase. 
and he says to draw and increase. Ki be'emuna yesh koach zeh shal yedei emuna yumshach hadavar azim koach v'yavor. He says the emuna has the power that when a person has faith, he's able to draw and increase it in his life from wherever it is. Meaning, that big pinata in the Shemaim, it's there. You want to draw it to you? You have a power to draw it into your life. How? Through your emunah. You can, whatever you're wishing for will eventually get, become increased, enlarged, and be a reality in your life. You can manifest your reality by the level of emunah that you have, and that emunah is the pipeline that draws what you need from the Shemaim. Hainu, al yedeshu ma'amin, ubotach b'kadosh baruchu be'emunah shenema, he says, by the way that a person believes and trusts, in, in, in complete trust in the Kadosh Baruch Hu, and as nimshach al shum ez davar, as nimshach davar hu ba b'shlimut. He says, and a person yearns for a particular thing, that particular thing gets drawn into his life, into reality completely. You are able to draw whatever you want into your life. Through the pipeline of emunah, the more you believe in God, the more you trust in God, the more that that is going to get drawn into your life through the pipeline of emunah. He says the Noam Elimelech, and uh, he says in the name of his brother, Rav Zusha. Amen. 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 Says, Im Adam Hayamamin Shakadosh Baruch Hu Zan Lekol Chai. If a person really truly believed that Kadosh Baruch Hu feeds every single creation in this world, if we really, really believe that God supports all of His existence, we will never be lacking a single thing in our life. He brings back that question. Ah, manu chal We said, oh, what are we going to eat on the sabbatical year? He says, anybody who has doubt on how Hashem is going to support him, he breaks the fight. Start to doubt. The minute you start to doubt God of how He's going to provide for you, that pipeline starts to get damaged. Holes, breakages. Block it. Block it. Huh? Block it. Blocked. It says that's why the farmer has so much faith. Because he takes a seed, he puts it into the ground, he covers it with dirt, and he trusts that this is going to turn into an apple tree. He trusts that this is going to turn into a cucumber. He already has that. He lives with God. He, 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 he lives his emunah day to day. That's why the Shemitah is, 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 is projected and, uh, and, and, and exemplified through the farmer. Because here's somebody who has true emunah. Look at the process of what it takes to be a farmer and the faith you got to have that these crops are going to come true, are going to come to fruition. Finally, he brings over here Adam HaRishon. That this whole thing is connected to Adam Rishon. He says, Shoresh Chet Etz Hadat Hayam Achshavat Akfira. He says, Remember the original sin? What was the source of the original sin? Heresy. That the snake made Adam and Chava believe that, uh, that Akadosh Baruch Hu ate uh, uh, Adam and Chava, that, that, what, that Hashem ate from the tree, and that's how he became all knowing. And he told us, don't eat from that tree so you don't become all-knowing. That's what the Nachash made Adam and Chava believe. So what was his punishment for this heresy? Adam ba'avurecha. The land was cursed because of, uh, of his actions. So since he was a heretic and the ground was cursed because of him, what is the way that is going to rectify that? So now we have to make him a believer. How do you make him a believer? He says, now put the seed into the cursed ground. Now you're going to have to believe that who? Hashem is the one. So Adam Rishon was the... His sin was because he was a heretic. He didn't believe in God. He didn't have emunah in God. Hashem says, ah, okay, you don't have emunah in God. Now I'm going to give you the lesson of you having to believe in God. One, that you have to believe uh, that when a person puts the seed in the ground, that Hashem is the one that makes it grow. Final point that he makes over here, he says that, that through the process of Shemitah, that a person... Uh, emunah is what allows it to, the, the crop to last for three years. 
He says this is the, the, the mitzvah that strengthens the emunah and bitachon in the Jewish people. And the stronger we are in, in, in faith and trust in Kadosh Baruch Hu, it fixes the original sin of Adam Rishon. And that is what the final redemption is all hinged on, of us having a, 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 a tremendous amount of faith in God. That's why we say, Anachnu ma'aminim, b'nei ma'aminim, right? What is everything that has to do with Mashiach? Ve'enanu mifached, ayla ashabim ashamayim, no. What's the song with the Emunah, with Mashiach? Remind me. Ani ma'amin, b'emunah shema, b'viyat ha-Mashiach. You have to have Emunah for Mashiach. No Emunah, no Mashiach. That's the master key. So we see this last part over here from Shvila Pinchas, it says, you are able to manifest your reality. How? According to the, to the size of your emunah. The more faith you have, the more you're going to have, uh, be able to uh, draw your, uh, the, the shefa into your life. In conclusion, Shabbat, Shemitah, Yovel, these three concepts are just a chizuk be'emunah ve'bitachon. It's just to strengthen our faith and trust in the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And every single time, it was always one ingredient that was always included, which was learning Torah, learning Torah, learning Torah. And not only that, we said that this learning Torah, this learning Torah that we do when we're not working, that's what increases our faith in God and also hastens the redemption. And when it comes to, if you ever get to the point where you have doubt in God, what am I going to eat on the seventh year? How am I going to pay my bills? Know that your emunah is low. And when your emunah is strong, that you're out there with confidence, God will give me what I need, when I need it, at the right time, according to my sins and according to my teshuvah. And I accept that I'm a product of my, uh, of my, uh, 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 of my uh, choices. Because we live in a generation that everybody's entitled. Everybody feels that they need, they deserve without doing anything. And as if all their sins are forgotten. That's the problem. If you know that you did something wrong and that's why you don't get, that's why you don't have what you want to get, it's easier to accept your fate and the, and, the, and the place in life that you're in. That's why when you have emunah, you're able to connect to the shefa. And the more you believe in God, the more it comes down. The more you believe in God, the more you trust in God, the more it comes down. It comes down and eventually becomes a reality. Shashem barech otchem, v'sameach otchem, and we should be strong in our faith, we should be strong in our emunah, be strong in our bitachon na kadosh baruch hu, and that we should learn that we don't need to be farmers in order to activate this master key to life, but rather we can learn from the farmer to live with God, to have faith in God, and to activate all the, all the tools that we're giving to Him, which we see, it's rest and Torah learning, gives you all the success you want in the physical world. Amen. 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 Amen.